when I talk with any leader in an organization or manager, I often hear this tension between short-term and long-term objectives. Have you ever felt that, where you say, hey, there are things that I know that would be best for us short-term that may not be as good for long-term, or I don't even have time to think about it. So I'm going to make the argument that and when I say short term, I mean running your school today, what you have to do to keep the wheels running. Versus, hey, I, sometimes you have to make a decision today, but it's not in support of today, right? It's in support of something next year or two years or three years out. That's the idea. I would argue that the way you think and behave should be fundamentally different. Here's what I mean by that. For the short term, it is all about dashboards and, and metrics. Does anybody here use dashboards, red, yellow, green, all that business? Metrics for success, some organizations call these KPIs, key performance indicators. Emphasis on analytics. How many of you in this room have to do forecasting of any type, whether it's a budget or revenues or enrollment, right? What is a forecast based on, typically? Two things. Historical data and our assumptions about the future. I would make the argument that in most cases, the further away you get from today, the less likely it is that you can accurately mathematically model the future. Oh, we try. But the further away we get from today, the less likely it is that we can accurately mathematically model. But for the short term, we can do pretty well, right? This is about you know, continuous improvement, alignment of incentives, and yes, a bias towards action. Get her done, as they say in Texas. By the way, I have to tell you real quickly, my very favorite acronym for this I learned from a European bank, I don't have time to talk, tell you the whole story, but, but it was basically this bank that was very, very, very focused on short term, to their detriment, by the way, but it was all short term. And I remember the first time I and a couple of colleagues from Wharton met with some senior people there, we kept saying, we thought we were talking strategy, right? We said, where do you want to be three years from now? What kind of bank do you want to be? And they kept saying, you don't understand. We don't worry about, we don't worry about next month. We're all about today. We just JFDI. JFDI this and JFDI that. And finally I said, is that a UK banking term? I'm not familiar. And they said, oh no. Does anybody know what it means? Just blank and do it. It's a Scottish equivalent of get her done. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I think I can say this safely in this room. That's crude language and I apologize. About a month after this first visit, unfortunately this is a true story, my church was having a women's retreat. It's not a good story. And they asked if I'd speak at it, okay? And the theme was, how do you have the courage to step out of the boat, make the changes in your life you know you need to make? So I like to bring in my business experience when I do this, right? So here I am. Why, I was just in Scotland, and in business we call this execution, and JFDI. And then I remembered my audience, which was the church ladies. <laughs> so I changed it to just faithfully do it. <laughs> that is a true story. <laughs> That is a, they thought I was spiritual and close to God. That is agility, people. That is agility. I did fess up, but that's good, right? But JFDI, it works on spouses and children. And by the way, I still spend about 20% of my time in the academic world. These people do not know how to JFDI. Do you know what I mean? You go to these meetings, it's like blah, 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 blah. And you want to stand up and say JFDI. <laughs> JFDI, please, for all that is good. So that, I'm not saying that JFDI is not good. But now we have to make a decision, and it's not for today, it's for longer term. A more strategic decision, something with more uncertainty. And let me just very quickly, and then I'm going to have you guys talk at your table, I promise, for a couple minutes. When I say strategy, I mean anything that's sort of a longer term, sort of looking past sort of the, the short term horizon. And I think of strategy in two parts. Part one is... Here I am today, where do I want to be at some future date? You can call this your strategic vision. You can call this your aspirational strategic objectives. But it's some sense that you can describe where, where your end point is. And I would argue that should not be changing all the time. If, you're, if that's changing all the time, it's going to be chaos. But part two of strategy is what is my pathway to achieve it? And I would argue in an environment of uncertainty, you may, in fact, need to change your path. You're going to have to pivot, be agile, be adaptable, be nimble, be flexible, whatever your favorite buzzword is. And let me give you an example quickly. It's a company we love to pick on in business school, Blackberry. Does anybody here have a Blackberry that you'll admit? Okay, all right. 
Now, if I'd asked this question 10, 12 years ago, how many of us would raise our hand? We'd all raise our hand. Right? If you think about BlackBerry from the cell phone side, BlackBerry's part one of strategies, I describe it, was always we want to be the preferred provider for organizations, right? If individuals want to use our phone, that's fine, but I want the University of Pennsylvania, and I want your schools, and I want Procter & Gamble to use, I want Coca-Cola to use the BlackBerry as their corporate phone, and they had achieved that had they not 10, 12 years ago. Did it seem like every organization on this planet used BlackBerry? I don't even remember who the, who the competitor was. What was their competitive advantage? Why did every organization on this planet use BlackBerry, it seemed? Does anybody remember? Security. BlackBerry had the best security for our emails. What happened along the way? Something must have happened along the way because nobody has Blackberries anymore. And by the way, if you had told me that 10 years ago, I would have said, you're crazy. Right? Who would have thought that none of us would have Blackberries? There was nothing wrong with their part one of strategy. They just didn't adapt. Something had to have happened because now organizations feel like they get the security that they need from other devices. It didn't happen overnight, and this is a major point for today. Let's go back. It's 10 or 12 years ago. We all have our Blackberries. I don't know why, but we had to put them on our hip. Do you remember that? We had to walk around with them on the hip. I'm not sure what that was about. <laughs> what was the first thing that told you something's different? What said, oh my gosh, maybe it's not all about Blackberry. What was released? The iPhone. And what was Blackberry's reaction? <laughs> it's a toy. It's what you play Angry Birds on. It's what you listen to music on. It's not for business. And then I'd go to something like this a few months later, a year later. I'd see all of you sitting out there, and you would have two phones. You remember those days? You'd have BlackBerry for work, but boy, I like those apps. And then I'll never forget, a good friend of mine works for Johnson & Johnson. You know J&J, &J, 150,000 employees around the world. She came to a party one Saturday night. She was so excited. She said, I can't believe it. Our IT people just announced, we don't have to use the BlackBerry as our corporate phone. We can use whatever device we want. And I thought, rest in peace, BlackBerry. <laughs> because when a company the size of Johnson & Johnson with its security concerns says you can use whatever you want, it's done. There was nothing wrong with their goal. And I want you to think in your mind about your schools. What is your goal and how do you achieve it? Because it's going to be different potentially. So with that in mind, we now have to make a decision today, but it's for longer term. I would argue it's not about your ability to predict. It's about your ability to manage uncertainty. I'm going to say that again. It is no longer a game of who can predict better. It's about your ability to say, I, am I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to be prepared. Imagine this. You have a decision to make for the long term. And you've got some uncertainties. You have a choice. You can say, well, I'm not going to make this decision until the uncertainties become a certainty. What's the danger there? You'll never make the decision. Or you can say, you know what, let's try to predict what's going to happen, hope and pray we're right, and make a big bet. And I do realize sometimes we have to make a big bet. Don't get me wrong. But I also think that in the U.S. in particular, we like people that are bold. Go big or go home, baby. And yet sometimes the problem with making big bets, high risk, high reward. What if you're wrong? What if I told you that there are some way, in many decisions, there's a way that you can say, I'm going towards alternative A. We're choosing A. But as we do that, we are going to explicitly identify what our key uncertainties are and be ready to dynamically monitor them Look for early indicators so that we can anticipate where we may need to pivot. I want to, see, I think this is what the game's about now. It's not about uh, predicting. I think it's about your ability to say, I'm going to anticipate where we have to pivot, so I'll be ready. It's not just about uh, uh, the tolerance for failure. Organizations are now using the term test and learn or, or, or rapid experiments. I'll say one more thing, and then I want you to talk real quickly at your table. This notion of optionality and, yes, dynamic scanning. That's the second thing I hope that you remember. Dynamic scanning, looking for early indicators of change. I can't tell you how important I think this is. And the people who see the early indicators are often not the people at the very, very top of an organization. It's the people that are closest to the external environment. But you have to have a, 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 a culture that encourages this. 
I'll give you a couple of examples. About five, six years ago, I was asked to do a keynote speech for a large technology company, okay, 400 of their executives. I won't tell you who it is, but you probably see it every time you open your computer. And it starts with an M, but I'm not going to tell you who it is. So about two months before I did this talk, I got an email, no kidding, with my contract in it. Dr. Pearson, it says in the email, in your presentation, you're not allowed to bring any Apple products. You can't have a Mac on the lectern. You can't have an iPhone on the lectern. Dr. Pearson, in your speech, we would prefer that you not say the word Google. OK. If somebody asks you to do a two-hour speech and you can't say the word Google, do you know what your subconscious wants to say the entire time? <laughs> Google. Google, Google. It's hard not to say Google. Go bing that book. It doesn't cut it. I'm just saying. You can pretend that Apple and Google don't exist. They're still there. And anyway, I realize it's a small sample, but you're having outside speakers come in to talk to your group. What a way to see what other people are doing outside of your bubble. But here's the rest of the story. I do some work with Google, and I happen to be on the West Coast about four weeks after this, okay, with a bunch of people from Google. They call themselves Googlers. It's really weird. So I'm sitting there with a bunch of Googlers, and this woman that's sitting next to me, this Googler, she has an iPhone. So I whisper to her, are you allowed to have an iPhone? Don't you have to have a Google phone? She looked at me like I was crazy. And she said, of course I can have an iPhone. Why wouldn't I be able to have an iPhone? In fact, Google bought me this iPhone. I put in a requisition, Google bought it. Google buys whatever device we want. Now, if we choose something that's not a Google or Google-supported phone, sometimes they ask us to fill out a form and say why we like that one better. <laughs> Gathering intelligence, learn, 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 learn. Here's another one. This is interesting. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I was up in New York. Maybe it's a little longer than that. Um, New York City. I live in Philly. And I had an occasion to meet a woman that was with Marriott Hotels. Where are we right now? Sheridan, right? Okay, so this is before Marriott had bought Sheridan and Starwood. So it's just Marriott. And she was with their luxury brands, JW Marriott and uh, Ritz-Carlton. And so she lives in Baltimore, and I said, hey, did you take the train up this morning? And she said, oh, no, I uh, came in yesterday. I wanted to stay at a competitor's property. Well, I travel all the time, so I'm always interested in this. Like, Who would you stay with? Who do you think she stayed with? So she's with Luxury Brands Marriott. Just shout it out. Who do you think? Hilton? Nope. That's what I guess. Whoever said Four Seasons, that was my guess. Waldorf Astoria? Nope. Big Think Broader? Airbnb. I said, Airbnb, isn't that one step above couch surfing? I'm confused. I thought you were luxury brands. And she said, oh, no. She said, I picked the most exclusive property in Greenwich Village, cool area in, in, in Manhattan. She said, before I even walked into that apartment, I had five different videos from the owner. Welcome to my apartment. There's a bottle of champagne chilling for you in the fridge. Cute little cafe around the corner for croissants tomorrow morning. She said, you know what Airbnb can do that we'll never be able to do at the Ritz-Carlton or JW Marriott? And I said, personalization. She said, no, we've got concierge services. They can get you a helicopter if you want it. She said, for 24 hours, I felt like a New Yorker. For 24 hours, I was a, I was a local. I lived in New York City, and I had the croissants from the cute little cafe. She said, it doesn't matter how fancy our lobby is or how, or how personalized our, our concierge service is. We can't do that. And do you know, about two and a half months ago, look it up. You can Google it or Bing it if that's what you prefer. Marriott announced they're starting a division to compete directly with Airbnb. Now, I don't know if that woman was like a super secret spy or whether she went back to her people and said, holy beep, we better do something about this. Interesting, right? So I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work, but... You know, if you're reading about something in your trade journal in SAIS today, right, it's not an early indicator. In fact, one of the things I want to do as we close up, I want to show you a couple of early indicators I've heard that may or may not have anything to do with what you do. But I just thought you'd find it interesting. It's about learning. It's about, and by the way, a great, if you like to read, you know, articles on leadership and, and those kinds of things, there's a great article that was published one year ago this month in the Harvard Business Review. It's called The Business Case for Curiosity. 
And I know that all of you teach your kids, your students, about how to learn and be curious. Do we practice it ourselves? It makes the business case for curiosity. Why we as leaders and we as managers and we as employees ought to be curious. It's about learning. It's not just about analytics. So I have talked too much. I want to give you two minutes at your table, and then I'm going to give you a way to think about this and move forward. But two minutes, does this apply to you? Do you say, Kathy, that sounds great theoretically. You're not grounded in the real world, or this is how we do this at our school. So talk for two minutes at your table, and we'll come back together. Your enthusiasm's overwhelming, by the way. <laughs> it's overwhelming. Talk to me.